Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another Fuse Meet session. I hope you're doing well out there in the crypto verse. Lots of positivity floating around at the moment with a tinge of negativeness as well, just as we like it in the crypto land. Today, you're here with me, Ian Kane, and in this session, we'll be chatting with the managing partner of Blockchain Founders Fund, Ali Madhaji. Let's do a quick sound check. How are you doing, Ali? I know it's early over there for you. How are you doing today, man? You good? Doing well. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be uh, here chatting with you. I'm loving that early morning energy, Ali. That is, uh, that's inspirational on my side. So just a bit of admin for the people who don't know. Uh, maybe this is the first time you've tuned into a Fuse Network show. Fuse is a unique blockchain. Our main aim is to bridge the gap between crypto and real world. Blockchain technology, our blockchain technology stack, along with our new charge product, is really tailored to help small to medium businesses and large businesses embrace Web3 crypto payments. Also reduce the cost of sales, help them build out better customer rewards and loyalty systems, and all with really minimal knowledge of smart contracts and coding, which is what people need. So Blockchain Founder Fund was an early investor in the Fuse blockchain and has continued to support and guide us ever since. So we've invited Ali on the show to talk about what they do over there at BFF, which projects they're incubating right now, uh, who's making the most noise, and what excited them about working with Fuse Network when they when they got involved with us a few years ago. So with that in mind, enough for me. We're going to dive in and, and start talking to Ali. But the first thing I always like to do, Ali, and I've been stalking you a little bit on LinkedIn, and your um, your CV is pretty impressive, man. Tell me about yourself. I saw United Nations there. Blockchain Founders Fund, a whole bunch of other stuff. Tell me about yourself, man. How did you get into this space? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, thanks so much again for having me. Um, so, as mentioned, Ali Madavji, managing partner at Blockchain Founders Fund. And we invest in and help venture build, you know, top tier startups, right? And so our whole objective from the early days, um, you know, has been to, one, help companies navigate a lot of the challenges that startups typically face, right? So you can think of like product market fit, uh, you know, stickiness, retention, driving user bases, sort of those aspects. Okay. But there's also like an entire part that's sort of Web3 unique, right? So this is now around like token economics and like shared, you know, ec economics with your users and like community-based uh, products, right? Which is very different from sort of the traditional sort of Web2 angle. Sure, yeah. And um, and this has gone really well, right? So been full-time in this space now six years. So yeah, That's so full-time for, for quite a while. Yeah. And um, and it's it's been quite the journey, right? When I started, I thought I was late to move full-time into the space. Um, and, uh, you know, there had already been so much innovation um, and you know, it's just continued on an, on an exponential pace. I think there's still a lot of gaps. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of gaps out there. There's a lot of parts where, you know, sometimes this technology gets overhyped before yeah. it actually gets there and, and, and starts making that impact. Yeah. And then, you know, on the other hand, you're seeing some, some stuff that's underhyped, right? And so, and what we can talk about that as well. And so sometimes there's things that don't get enough credit for, for what they've been doing and the impact that they're having in the industry. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that keeps us busy. And apart from that, as you mentioned, we've done a ton of work with the United Nations. Uh, we put together one of the um, you know, flagship internal reports on how blockchain and, and crypto can help achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals and help alleviate poverty. Uh, we've also been working with INSEAD, which is one of the leading business schools in the world, uh, you might have seen we recently published um, the first academic case study in the world on Binance, uh, which we worked with CZ on, uh, the founder of Binance. Uh, we also did something similar with so rare. if you're familiar with them. They're a, a French unicorn in the, in the Web3 sports space. Lots of really, really, exactly, right? So lots of really, really cool stuff. And the idea is, you know, how do we also make sure that we're helping, you know, future leaders, uh, you know, both within like executive positions at companies all around the world or, you know, students as part of some of the top, you know, MBA programs in the world to actually learn about what's going on in this space, but learn from some of the best examples in the world. Right. And I think that is yeah. very powerful from an education standpoint. That's a really uh, apart from strong point, yeah, yeah I mean, a strong point. Not thought of it like that. It's a it's a strong point that you just made there about the kind of two way. But yeah, sorry, sorry, carry on. Right, uh, and then apart from that, I mean, I, I do serve on a couple of public company boards, uh, sort of over the years, um, mm -hmm. and so that are in the Web three blockchain space. And so, 
keep keeps us busy. Um, and we're now at about a hundred portfolio companies. So it's been quite in, in the web three space. And so it's been quite an exciting journey, uh, sort of over, over the years. That's really cool. I will jump into some of the, the actual, uh, projects in, 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 a, in, a, in a little bit, because I'm familiar with some of them. And when I was looking through your portfolio list, I was like, Oh, okay. 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 This is something I use. This is something I know about. So it was very cool. And we'll jump into specifics a bit later as well, but being involved with all those projects, Ali, it's pretty time consuming, to say the least, but, um, how do you kind of, how do you go about choosing who you want to spend your time with in a business sense, right? So working with the U. Uh, sorry, working with the United Nations and doing those things, are they receptive? Is it something that you're enjoying doing? Is it like how do you how do you choose what you get into the most? You know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the so the work with the UN, a lot of that has been you know we started a number of years ago, right? And sort of we've tried to pare down on some of that work just um you know just given sort of other other commitments mm -hmm. uh at the moment but uh it can be receptive and i think it can be quite impactful but i think as uh, you know anyone would know working with large organizations whether that's an intergovernmental or just a large corporate i mean it it moves at a different pace than the startup world right and and so while you can sort of make tectonic shifts in terms of impact. It, it is slow um, and it is slower. And I think everyone's sort of aware of that when you start comparing that to startup pace, yeah. right? Um, but I think there's a, a very big education component that comes along with it as well, right? So before you can start talking about solutions, we've got to actually get everyone on the same page and help them understand, you know, the different types of uh, problems and why they, they exist, right? So for example, um, you know, you take the banking industry and, you know, there's a number of problems in the banking industry, but there's a reason why we have over a billion people unbanked, right? And there's, and there's a couple of key things that come to mind. One can be affluence at times, right? So if they're not very rich, banks just don't see an ROI banking them. Yep. Uh, but the other one that's, that's quite big is this problem around uh, de-risking for, for banks, right? And so because of sanctions and other like AML criteria that you might be held to as like a U.S. bank, mm -hmm. a U.S. bank will then refrain, as an example, will then refrain from working with a bank in Kenya mm -hmm. out of the risk that the Kenyan bank might do something that is not transparent or that might not be legal. And so because of that risk, they might entirely stop working with all banks in Kenya, as an example. Got it. And yeah. this actually cuts off the financial system. So the financial system is not really global in a lot of cases. It's actually, you know, Sorry. works in the developed world. And then you take the developing or emerging world. And oftentimes it's like fully cut off uh, because of these de-risking issues. And this is a very big, very, very big issue that's talked about um, on an international level. Yeah. And this is where there is, you know, some really interesting aspects on disconnecting from, you know, the traditional global system in a way and potentially leapfrogging that system with borrowing lendings and savings products for consumers directly, um, but also potentially increased transparency in the future by leveraging some of these technologies. Obviously, very complicated when you start trying to solve that de-risking issue, even in this way. Um, yeah. But I think there is potential to have an alternative system in the way that it works because it doesn't it doesn't work right now for everybody. Right. And it's no. not a mistake, in my opinion, that a billion people are left out of the system. I mean, it's also deliberate in a lot of ways. Um, and I mean, so you, these are these are types of issues that I, I think, you know, need to be resolved and need to be talked about even more than, than they are today. You can understand like the risk management side of it. I can see why it's a conversation that needs to be had, but I don't understand why the conversation stops at the point when they say there's risk. Oh, forget it then. When they're doing it in so many other circumstances globally. But as you say, the big point there, I think, Ali, is that the global payment system is pretty fractured and broken and that people, one of the big things for me is access to capital, right? So like the human, on a human level, a whole bunch of people walking around in the world without access to capital with 120 IQs. That's not fair. Huge problem. So, so this, this actually, this problem goes deeper than, than that. So 
a big part of it comes from uh, like credit and asset registries. Mm -hmm. So in, in a lot of emerging markets, you don't necessarily have uh, like credit systems. So like even like credit scoring, knowing who's reliable or trustworthy and who's not potentially and using anecdotal data or like a, like uh maybe more like micro data to start mm -hmm. determining this for example if you pay your phone bill often like 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 every time on time right obviously in emerging markets there's a lot of prepaid but um but but you sort of get the idea like starting to use some of these things or if you took a micro loan and you consistently paid it back on time yeah. like that Whatever. should help you to build that reputational score right um and, and credit scores have a ton of issues even in the, in the yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of you know but but you know there's there still needs to probably be some sort of way to determine who to lend to right and and so uh that's sort of one aspect the other aspect is even if you own assets i think this one's actually in some ways uh just as big of an issue even if you own assets so let's say you're a farmer right there's 500 million smallholder sort of farming uh families or individuals in those families right so we're talking about like a lot of people in the world and a lot of this is an emerging market mm -hmm. and you know, you own tractors and you own land and this sort of thing, right? But then you can't borrow against it to fund your business, which is going to be to actually be able to grow more things and optimize and, and, and reinvest into your property. And this is a huge issue because in, in the, you know, in, in North America or Europe or, you know, more, you know, advanced countries, you don't even have to think about it. Like you can get lines of credit, you can get, you know, these types of aspects and, and reinvest very easily. And it makes sense from an ROI perspective. I mean, if you're going to be growing things, being able to sell them and you're borrowing at 5% or 7% or whatever, 10% even, like it's an easy like decision. Mm -hmm. But in emerging markets, this doesn't even exist, right? There, there's no actual asset registries to even say you own this tractor and you can borrow against it. So it can't even and so. They do have, yeah. It's... So, so even if you have some accumulated capital, you can actually leverage it in a way that allows you to reinvest and build off of it. And this is a huge problem. Um, and these are the types of problems that we're hoping over time, there's alternative systems that can come in in a way leveraging Web3 over time, right? But I, I think we've still got a long journey to go there. Uh, we're still not even seeing too many things happening on this front. Uh, but I think there's a lot of potential. And I think this is where people forget or pe people oftentimes overlook really this movement in, in, in Web3 and in crypto, right? Like if you, think about, if you think about blockchain in the sort of simplest form, mm -hmm. it solves multi-party trust issues where there's a lack of trust and transparency. Yeah. Instantly. Right? And so when you have these multiple parties, like, individuals creditors and government it solves the problem right yeah. and it can be easily leveraged in that way now same thing in a digital world like pe people oftentimes overlook what nfts are even right like you might think that nfts are jpegs or that's what most people talk about it's the first way in human history to track ownership in a digital world mm -hmm. right and if we're talking about these asset registry problems and credit registry problems we're going to have the same problems in the digital world. We're only spending more and more time in the digital world versus the physical world. And so these are critical innovations that we yeah. haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg on the impact that's going to be coming out of this over the next decade, two decades, three decades, and, and then generations to come. Just like you're getting it from, I'm just, I mean, I'm just nodding away because everything you're saying, I couldn't agree more. And it's just, so, it's profound, really. Like we are a long way away, not, you know, we're not light years away, but we're getting there. But these iterations of what we're seeing of Web3 applications are kind of, they're the building blocks as I see it, Ali. Like each, the summer of DeFi for whatever good and bad, it, it also gave us a lot of innovation. And GameFi is giving us different innovations to what people think. I think it's giving us like, in and, and like Metaverse is giving, the real innovation there is like, how are people going to talk to each other in the Metaverse? How are we going to build tools? to enable people to actually facilitate fun and activity in here. And I think it's like really critical. We're at a very critical time, I think, where people are starting to understand this a bit more, right? The We've built all the bits we needed, but we just haven't put the Lego together correctly at this moment in time. But 
I mean, we're talking about payments and we're talking about Web3 payments. And obviously that's a big focus of what Fuse Network is all about. So I must ask, you know, what kind of drew you towards Fuse as a, as a blockchain and like the kind of projects that we want to the nurture there? Is it, do you see some synergy there between what we're trying to do and what you guys are doing, basically? No, 100%, right? I mean, from, from the perspective of, of you know, pe people have oftentimes talked about crypto for payments, Bitcoin for payments. I mean, a lot of this so far to date has not really worked, right? I mean, nobody that I even know is, goes and buys a coffee with Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. And probably the best example I would say to date has been being able to transfer Bitcoin or other crypto or stable coins to say like a crypto.com card and then using the traditional visa rails. Yeah, and you yeah. still have all of the challenges then with those traditional visa rails. Mm -hmm. And then when you take that to emerging markets, they either may or may not have visa support. Mm -hmm. And in the future, one of the risks we also identified as part of some of our work with the United Nations is there's also technically a sovereign risk to putting your entire infrastructure put on one foreign company, True. right? Yeah. And so, you know, either countries need to consider building their own over time because of that sovereign risk, right? If your entire payment infrastructure is on one, one party that can be turned off for political or other reasons, um, every country has a risk because overnight this could be shut down yeah. and your entire economy stops. Right. Because payments can't flow and you lose velocity of money. And so these are major, major challenges where we think as a sovereign risk, even countries are going to have to adopt some other infrastructure. And probably it's going to start to leverage more of a Web3 type of layer in the longer run. And maybe that's a private blockchain. Maybe that's a public blockchain. And there's different pros and cons to, to both from a government perspective. Um, but payments are critical and the ability to do micro transactions, uh, is critical, right? And Fuse has been, I would say at one of the best blockchains that we've seen at being able to do hyper quick instant transactions that are secure. And it's not, not only for payments, right? It's even exactly. if you talk about gaming, right? Um, you know, in, in what world do we think we're going to continue in where people are going to buy $2,000 like, you know, videos or, 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 or JPEGs consistently? Like there was a there was an aspect in the early part of NFTs that was hype and mm -hmm. it was novel and people were interested and that worked. Yeah. Uh, but in the long run, I mean, take the disposable income for your average person and even in, in, in de developed or advanced countries and then take it in emerging economies, it doesn't make sense, right? To have $2,000 of disposable income for one specific game, you easily need to have millions of dollars, right? I mean, uh, as a net worth. And, and so that obviously doesn't work for most of the world. Yeah. And so we're looking at gaming as being microtransactions, people renting or, or moving assets for one cent or five cents or 10 cents or a dollar or two dollars. And exactly. it needs to work for the entire spectrum. And so this is where this uh, efficient layer like views and there's, you know, some other examples help to bridge that gap of where we think the world and, and this industry has to go just from a natural perspective of being able to onboard, you know, users around the world into this industry absolutely absolutely i mean looking down the portfolio list of um i mean actually sorry ali just from um were you yourself i, I want to talk about what you look for in the projects that you work with as well so what do you look for in a founder and i have another question you know were you once a founder do you have empathy with founders and startups like is that something that you can have yeah yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes, I, I, I did found a company um, and growing up always hyper entrepreneurial, probably had a dozen plus businesses even by the time I was 18. Right. Nice. So you get um, it. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and, and we actually don't look at ourselves as investors. So the vast majority of our team has been founders. Um, one of the things and I mean, Fuse can attest to this and many others, you know, we always have the back of our founders and, and our, and our portfolio companies don't look at us as their investors. They look at us as their partners and supporters and, yeah. 
you know, this is why, you know, any of our companies that have an issue, like whether that's, you know, an internal issue and external issue, they come to us first and they're like, Hey, what should we do? Or what's the advice? And, and, and oftentimes founders are scared to go to their investors or like worried about how to frame stuff and want to sort of put it into a more packaged, you know, box. It don't look like like a mistake or there's something negative there, right? They might even hide it from you as an investor who's interested in bottom line. So you can't, right? Yeah. But, but I think one of our advantages is we don't have that problem. Right. So with us, like, and, and our founders, we're like, we know our companies inside out. Like we talk to our companies very often. We know all of the things that are in the pipeline. We know when things are going wrong. We know when deals fall apart. We know if there's founder issues. We know if there's, in a lot of cases, I mean, even, uh, you know, one of the ways that this started when BFF started is we sort of looked at it as family with our founders. And so even to the point of, you know, talking to our founders about mental health when they had challenges around this in the early days or, or challenges with their spouses or, or things like this. And like, it's not just at the end, problems, right? At, no. And, and at the end of the day, though, these are, I mean, human problems are a big aspect to startups as well, right? I mean, if we're not able to operate or solve these problems, I mean, we're not going to be able to solve the biggest problems in the world, you know, leveraging this technology. And, and so there is still an aspect where these things are very important. I think there's a big element of trust and, you know, transparency there between, between us and our companies, right. And our founders. And so, I think this is actually, you know, very, very important. Um, and, and that's how we look at it. I mean, we have about 90 different things that we look at when we evaluate a startup. Right. Um, and, you know, we can't always answer all of those questions. And we invest in companies really early as well. So oftentimes things like market size might not even exist because the industry doesn't exist entirely sure. like that subsector, right? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. but some of, some of the more interesting things that we like, care about even is like coachable like coachability of a founder because we work so closely with them and even like simple things like do we like them i mean if we're going to be spending our time (laughs) that's what i was going to say we want to like who we're working with we want to yeah exactly uh but these things are important right because these are the things that are going to allow us to build an even closer relationship and then deliver and drive more value together and build exponential growth and that's that's sort of the objective um you know here to to transform the world that's the the business objective is clear for all parties i'm sure but then i really like what you're saying you know you're handling this human side of things with these people who in many instances are quite young people with a big responsibility on their shoulders they've got good ideas they probably some founders have never even had a job and then all of a sudden they're in control of 25 people I mean, it, I, I don't envy some of their positions. So I think it's very admirable what you guys are doing. And that was a question I had, you know, I think a lot of the time people think I shouldn't have used the word investors because it gives a negative connotation that you're just kind of saying there's some money, crack on guys. Like, but that's not going to work. Like, and I, I think actually the money is the least thing that's required. The, the marketing, the brains, the know-how, the product market fit, taking it to market. These are the things that they don't know how to do. Building a cool product, they already kind of got on with that. So it's those things that you described that I think that's where the real value is, right? And they, I'm sure they uh, appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and, and every company is going to have their different gaps, right? Like some companies are going to be hyper strong from a product and tech perspective. And, you know, there's going to be no, no worries really on that front. But then there's going to be gaps on the marketing front or even like building feedback loops to sort of iterate more effectively, or it could be even on like, like it might be a really strong company that just doesn't know how to talk to investors effectively. And we need to work with them on that. Right. And help them sort of refine that or, or, you know, build a more transparent way of communicating with the public. Right. Because oftentimes as a web three company, I mean, you're basically building in the public spotlight and, transparency even from a even though it's embraced as an industry oftentimes like human the human element doesn't want to be transparent right because it's it's scary to tell someone publicly hey here's what we're going to achieve and then you're two weeks late but you know our whole philosophy is that the public is there to support you as well if you're going to be transparent with them they're going to understand that and like sure they will be holding you accountable but there is a 
there is an understanding and there is a appreciation for companies that, you know, are willing to be transparent with their community. And I think Fuse is actually really good at this, right? I mean, the updates that go out to the community consistently, like I see them on a weekly basis of what's going on, what was achieved, like, yeah. it, it, you know, what are we planning to do is incredible. And, and we've missed deadlines, right? But it's, and every company has missed deadlines, but that's, part of the goal, part of goal setting too, right? If you're achieving every deadline, you're probably not working hard enough. I mean, <laughs> probably not aggressive enough. That's what, yeah, um, no, I agree, man. I agree. <laughs> so, so, but I, but I think this is actually very important. It's a good lesson for a lot of companies too, to, to look at. Um, and I think it's a more unique aspect of this industry in particular um, that you see. And they presumably also are networking amongst each other. And that these projects are often complementing one another. If you think of the the BFF ecosystem, as it were, are there many companies that are kind of, oh, well, this service could complement my service and, oh, this could work for me. And is that something that just organically happens from having that kind of portfolio? Uh, I mean, we do see a fair bit of it. I mean, at the end of the day, we want our companies to go partner with whoever's the best in the world. So <laughs> yeah. whether that is in our portfolio or not, like we'd, we'd want them to, to to be the best in the world right and so um i think that's a it's an important aspect in this industry you do see some companies that try to reinvent the wheel and rebuild everything and like we don't like that, need that you know yeah. uh and we don't need that right and if there's a unique angle and like a key value proposition sure like there, there does need to be competition and different solutions but you know if if someone's built something let's go integrate it right um Absolutely. It, it, if, it, if it works and if it's efficient and it works on the right chains, and then there's obviously complications around like compatibility in this industry oftentimes. And so there's a lot of considerations, but, um, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel in every aspect. Right? Yeah, no. I think that's a good point, though. You want your, you want your clients to have the, the best, regardless of if it's in your ecosystem or not. So that's the right, that's the right way to look at it. But as I said earlier, looking down the portfolio list of what you've got, honestly, some of them that are there, the ones that, and this is not to do a disservice to any of the others, it's just perhaps the ones I've seen the most of. So the ones that really stood out for me were Splinterlands, because I'm well aware of Splinterlands and I've interviewed um, those guys quite a few times. Luna Crush, Record Box, which isn't a biggie at the moment, but I think it's got, for me, I'm very music. Record boy. Shop, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that. It's, it's like, a, I like flow, I like that vibe. And then LimeWire, which I know is turning, pivoting into an NFT marketplace. And, and I'm sure some people in this call are like, what's LimeWire? They were like a P2P torrent sharing. How long ago was it, Ali? Massive in the 90s. They were uh, big in the 90s, right? They were, yeah. when Friends was popping, LimeWire was there, right? They were. Yeah, it, was, it was like late, late 90s going into the 2000s. That's it. Um, so massive. They were, right? they were big, right? But those ones stood out for me. So I'm, I'm kind of, what I'm asking is, you know, why are these ones looking good for you? What's good about Luna Crush? Why are you excited about these projects and what they're doing? Because they each do their thing very differently to many of the other dApps that we see out there. And yeah, I just wanted to get inside your head a bit about what you see in these projects that kind of excites you a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you take Lunar Crush, right? I mean, they... Good one. probably have some of the best data and insights out of anybody in the industry. We think they're at the forefront. I mean, mm. we're talking about 10 plus million data points a day of even like social media messages that they're, that they're analyzing with natural language processing. I mean, these are just crazy numbers on a day to day basis that they're consuming and, and processing. Right. Um, and then they're synthesizing that and, and providing that information to users for free. Right. I mean, the amount of information and data that you get from Lunar Crush to discover, you know, new new things in this industry is like unprecedented. Um, and you know, you also look at the new product they launched on NFTs and being able to do the same thing on NFTs and NFT collections and the data that that that's coming through that. I mean, there, I don't think there's anything that that you know, it's even close to what they're doing right now in the in the space. So we're really excited about them. I mean very, very popular, uh, you know, company in the space. And we've been excited to be part of the journey from the early days. Nice. Um, you take something like Splinterlands. I mean, phenomenal how that's, 
you know, uh, you know, evolved and uh, over the years, right? I mean, I remember still when we came into Splinterlands, and we weren't investing big amounts in the early days. That, you know, similar to a lot of of, of people in the space. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about 2018, right? And so, I remember also taking this to some other top funds in the space, and I'm not going to name them, but you're you're going to know them. Uh, and the, the comments that I got on Splinterlands, and this was at a five million valuation, right? The comments that I got on Splinterlands were, "This is weird. It makes no sense. Why blockchain and gaming?" Like these were the comments back then from from many of the funds that that you would know very well. And you know, it's it's just crazy how now this seems very second nature to a lot of people. I think there's still a lot of issues in the gaming space, but there's a huge opportunity still. Uh, but Splinterlands has just, you know, gone on to be one of the dominant players in the space. I mean, multi-billion dollar company now. Uh, you know, I was just looking yesterday. We were doing, we, we ba- so Splinterlands is one that invented essentially rental markets for NFTs, right? And we did 4 million rentals successfully, uh, I think, yesterday, right? Like, it's just yesterday. crazy just yesterday. number. Just yesterday, successfully. Like, that... It's just crazy numbers. Um, but it's consistent. People don't realize it. It's been consistently a top three game on DAP Radar. Like, uh, I also work at DAP Radar, Ali. So I've, that's why I'm kind of into the DAP side of things. And yeah, when I spoke, the, the, the impression I got from Splinterlands when I spoke to them, though, is they're all about the game, they're all about the fun. The tokenomics is obviously important, and they have to pull levers to make it balance and they have to make it work. But it's all about the fun, it's about playing a game. It's not about bashing oh, buttons. A hundred percent. So when we actually got involved at Splinter Lines, a really funny story, but, um, you know, we, we met Agro uh, in person and mm. um, we got to know him. We were interested in it, but like, didn't, like nobody was investing in blockchain gaming, right? Mm. Uh, mm. It wasn't a thing. No. And so we were, we just thought it was cool. And like, we all collected stuff, you know, over the years and like cards when we were kids and stuff like you were this. Into and, it. Like, yeah, you and, could see that. No, but we were just like, let's go try it. And we went and played the game and we it's got awesome. so hooked. No, no, we got so hooked. We started skipping meetings. We were <laughs> like, <laughs> so we're skipping meetings. We're, you know, canceling meetings, just addicted. <laughs> we're like, for like weeks, all right, we're like, we have to do this. Like, we have to be involved in this. Um, so Proof it wasn't of concept an, right there, right? Proof of concept, it, like, done, it, right? Exactly, right? And I think that's the type of thing that matters. And that's what a lot of yeah. games are missing. So, like, you see a lot of games launch the token at the same time as the game. And it becomes difficult to figure out if people are playing for the, like, if the funnel is fixed and optimized. And the yeah. gameplay is optimized. The economics are optimized. Like not the token economics, the game economics, yep. right? And so it gets masked because there's token aspects there. And so when you strip that out, does it go to zero or will it still operate effectively? And and, and I think in most games, that's uh, right now it's just propped up by the token. Whereas mm-hmm. Splinterlands and only a very select few others, um, you know, are are actually I think built in a way that, you know, even if the token wasn't there, would be extremely strong games. Absolutely. I agree with that. Yeah, Splinterlands would still have legs. If you remove the tokenomics, it's a really cool game. And uh, that's a great story. Like, um, that's brilliant. I've I've not heard anything like that for a while. So obviously you you were taken with Splinterlands and they've gone on to become one of, I think there's a lot more to come from them too. I think we're just seeing the beginning of what they're up to, like, You've got land. You've got all sorts of aspects coming in there as well. We just we just announced a partnership with MLS, um, and that's all the way through the the World Cup, the next World Cup, uh, all the way to the World Cup in North America. I mean, so you know, it's a it's a long partnership, and then uh, there's a lot of other things that are in the pipeline that'll be announced soon. So nice. Watch this space, right? So maybe you could share. Um, are there any projects that you're incubating right now that are you think are really going to change the way we look at the world, Ali? <laughs> I mean, there, there are a lot of things. I mean, for, for us, it's, uh, I mean, we don't call it incubation. We do come into projects really early and support them very hands-on. Um, and I, I, I think there's things, you know, all across the industry. I'll give you an example, right? So we have we have 25 open sub-thesis right now where we look for companies that solve problems that we think exist in the industry. Okay. And I'll give you one 
that some might agree with, some might not agree with, but I think it's it's very apparent. Um, so everyone, and probably every one of the listeners right now, is going to lose their Bitcoin when they die, or their crypto, all of it, because basically nobody has figured out a solution on how to transfer this to loved ones, right? <laughs> and, and we've just ignored this problem. And so, for example, we've been looking at will and trust solutions that are on chain. We don't think it can happen with lawyers. We don't think it can be in the traditional way. It needs to be fully web three. Smart um, Exactly. Contract. Wills and testaments makes sense to me. Yeah. Right. And so, but this is not talked about. Like, I go to all of these conferences, all these events. I don't hear anybody talk about it. I think this is one of the biggest problems when you think about it. It's a problem that affects 100% of users pretty much. Yeah. Um, they're talking and, about all day yacht club NFT PFP avatars more than they're talking about real world solutions. It annoys me exactly. too, Ali. I'm, glad, I'm happy to hear it. It annoys me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we just we just backed a, a company called Lightbeam that's doing this, um, and we think their solutions very interesting that, to solve this problem. But nice. you know, this is a, this is something that I'm sure we'll end up hopefully seeing more solutions of because this is a problem that needs to be solved. Um, yeah. And there's a, there's a huge market opportunity here, for example, right? So, uh, you know, we're excited about something like that. That's a pretty good example of, you know, an area that we think is going to transform. And it's a huge problem that just nobody's talking about. And, and, and there's a lot of room here. It really, it really does feel like that, right? Like they're not talking about it. And, and a part of me wants to say the, it's just a little bit perhaps boring for people to engage with on a big level. Like it's not boring is a horrible world. It is. It's a bit practical. It's a bit real. It's a bit, we're actually going to get some use out of it, whereas people generally prefer to talk about nonsense. And I think we've kind of, I've said it a few times this week already, and this conversation's going there too. It's like we've been a bit distracted in development of Web3 applications. Like I said earlier, they're stepping stones, right? And we need to kind of, it needs to grow up a little bit. And the fact that Mark said something the other day, that the fact that so many conversations are still happening it means it's still a little bit immature, right? And that the chatter means that we're not, not enough work happening, too much talk basically. So, but not in a negative way. I think it's an interesting time for us to be in. But um, all right, Ali, I think I've I've nailed our uh, our session today. I don't want to kill your, your, your time. I know you're a busy man. Um, and also one last thing, because the reason I do these sessions and I think people have got a very good idea of who you are and what you're about but um you are quite a prolific speaker i've seen you doing podcasts and other things and you seem to be a very natural advocate of blockchain and crypto and i just wanted you to share your kind of vision for what you see where we're going like what's exciting you and what's driving the current growth and kind of yeah what do you see as happening in the next five to ten years where are we going in this space like what's your what's your opinion on that it's a good question i mean i think you know, a lot of people are talking about regulation and, and sort of that forming around this industry. I think we're going to end up having two parallels uh, that that break out of this, right? So you're going to end up with this regulated world, right? Which, you know, you've already got a ton of discussions from regulators. You've got things starting to come into place. You've got more rules forming around on-ramps, around exchanges, around, you know, all sorts. Of, I mean, CFI is going to probably have a ton of regulation coming in. That's mm -hmm. probably going to trickle through to DeFi just with, you know, probably not enough understanding. You're seeing developers, you know, now even getting arrested, which is, Crazy. you know, concerning. Um, and, you know, where does that stop, right? How far does that go? Where does that leak to? And, you know, and, and maybe there's some justification or some of it right now, but the question is like, where does it stop, right? Yeah. Uh, but you're probably going to have this other world that just, you can't shut down, right? And that's where blockchain is quite interesting. Like you've got all of these products that can exist in a parallel, you know, basically world. And that's going to allow a lot more adoption and on ramps in the countries that, you know, primarily from users in other countries, but even potentially in, in you know, major privacy advocates, et cetera. Um, it, it, it will be interesting to see how this evolves. Uh, oftentimes, you know, when there are some of these failures and some of these like bigger, you know, things that happen in the industry, you get an over regulation and, and this can be a problem. It can stifle innovation. There's plenty of examples around that. Um, and so that can be worrisome, but I think what's interesting with blockchain is 
there's probably going to be a parallel universe that continues to exist regardless of regulation, regardless of how stringent it gets, which is not generally the case with most types of technologies because they don't have this ability to just operate. Um, yeah. And so this will be fascinating to see. Um, and my guess is that it will be a lot stronger on the non-regulated front than, than many might expect. Um, okay. Okay. And so yeah. there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to come, but in reality, I mean, even that problem we were talking about, about a billion people unbanked, I mean, this is the result of regulation. This is not a mistake and this is not acceptable. Like it's, to me, I think it's frustrating to, that we just be like, oh, that's regulation or it's okay. Like it's not okay. It's not okay to have a billion people unbanked and not have the opportunity for pouring lending and savings products than to be able to build off of that and build credit off of that and all of those other aspects. And so this is where we've got to really move the needle on changing the world, um, you know, in these types of aspects that I think is going to, you know, probably have a bigger impact at alleviating poverty and changing the world than any technology probably that's come before. I mean, it's almost the same as the, the or, or in some ways similar to the fintech revolution in, in China, right? And how many people that sort of pulled out of poverty, mm -hmm. you know, more than any charity or mm -hmm. nonprofit could have, right? And it's because aligning these sorts of things creates an ability for, for people to go make change themselves, right? It's that old, like, I'm not sure, it's like give a man a fish and he can eat for a day, give him a fishing rod and he'll eat for the rest of his life. It, it kind of draws back to that, doesn't it, a little bit. It's like you need to empower people, not hand out people, because it doesn't it doesn't really make sense. But thank you for that, Ali. Like, I really, I always kind of ask those questions to get an idea of what people think. But also, sorry, just to lead on from that a little bit, because we're talking about anonymity and we're talking about like how we feel about these things as well. Am I detecting a little bit of a Canadian twang in your voice there? Yes, I am Canadian. Right. So it's, you know, what I'm going to ask you about what was happening there recently and like how that seems to be the narrative that's being pushed quite often right now. Like it's a little bit scary what's happening there for me. Um, but, but how do you think that's going to play out? Like, do you think we're just going to, these are just stepping stones again? We, we need to go through these motions for people to understand okay. what they need. I, I mean, I think it's very clear all over the world that governments want more information, more information, more information. And then at some point they're going to use that information. Um, and it's going to be in a pretty widespread manner because it's hard to be targeted when you've got, you know, trillions of data points and pieces of data. And so, you know, you've got everything from mass collection in the U S to, uh, and then, you know, potential, you know, looking at, all sorts of stuff to try to find, you know, some bad actors, but it's really encompassing everybody almost as a, as a bad actor and then trying to, yeah, trying to sort of sift through it. Guilty. To um, and then in Canada, you've got, you know, some, definitely some overreaching uh, powers that shouldn't be there. And these are the types of things that I think are going to push more people in reality to, to the only solution, which is then going to be privacy. And we're hopefully going to, have a strong enough movement from the public and the average person understanding that privacy is critical to freedom and to success, you know, of, of our society. Cause otherwise, I mean, there's a lot of problems to come if um, we don't have, we don't have privacy. Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a really valid point. Actually, somebody just said something earlier in a call about blockchain It's like, if any technology has the power to be, to, to kind of ins not enslave, but to have that data in one place and be accessible, it's blockchain, right? So we have to create options and a way that we can sort of create our way out of a situation like that. So we don't want to end up like that, obviously. But all right, cool. Thank you so much, Ali. Really, thank you for your time today. I know it's early over there, so I really appreciate it today. Last, last thing, where can people reach out to you? Where can they connect with you? What kind of, you know, people basically that are launching projects, developers, they might want to talk to you. How can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one, we, we're at events all over the world. Uh, definitely can see us there. You can reach out to us on Twitter uh, at BlockchainFF or, or myself at Ali underscore Madabji. Or if yep. you go to our website, you can also share information with us on what you're working on. And we actually take a look at every single one in detail. And, and uh, our goal is to respond to every single founder that reaches out to us because 
wow. you know, and we always strive for that. Um, and, uh, and we've been founders before, so we get it. That's nice, right? Like, even if it's the, the little things, a reply is, it just shows what you're all about. So again, like I said before, I think these sessions, the best thing about it is for people to meet. So Blockchain Founders Fund backs Fuse. Fuse is about global payment systems and Web3 payments. I think the synergy is clear here and the synergy between what Fuse does and the projects that we try to, to onboard and what you guys are doing, there's also that as well. So thank you, Ali, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening, everyone who's tuned in. Um, we'll have more sessions up on our YouTube very soon. We do this once, twice a week. And like I say, really, it's about meeting the people behind the brands, meeting the people behind the companies that we all kind of know about, but perhaps don't know who's, who's behind the wheel a little bit. So that's what these sessions are for. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Ali. I've uh, really appreciated your time today. Maybe you want to give the last word, maybe just a thank you, and then we'll thank, sign up. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, keep up the great work if you're building cool products out there and definitely reach out to us. That's it, right? That's the objective. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.